I, I just give you a little bit about myself. So I, I've been in Vermont since 1996. I moved up here to make geologic maps as part of the new state geologic map that came in 2011. And I've worked, worked for the, new, the Vermont Geological Survey since 97. And what I've been doing over the past probably 15 years is trying to understand how aquifers get contaminated either naturally by things like uranium and arsenic that are in the rocks, naturally in the rocks, or now I've been working since 2016. Have you heard about the Bennington contamination problem where this chemical called PFOA has been in uh, the bedrock aquifer over a 16 square mile area? And so I've been working with that for the past three years. This August we started working up in uh, well, down in uh, Rutland, because the Rutland Airport um, has con contaminated groundwater essentially surrounding it. And so the reason that is, is that, so there's a necessity to, 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 to have firefighting drills for airplane crashes, right? The FAA requires that. And any airport that takes aircraft over a certain um, size has to do this. Anyway, so they had to test these firefighting foams over the past three decades and now it's all in the groundwater. And so, and so what I'm going to talk to you about is, is my work with groundwater and contamination and I'm going to bring up as much as I can about Woodbury, but I'm going to talk about all the different aspects of geology that go into this. It's, if you say there's hydrogeology, and that's different from bedrock geology, which is different than glacial geology, which is different than geochemistry. We do, we do everything, because you need to actually look uh, at as many different things as you can. So with that being said, I should be able to go. Okay. Why is this? That's my. So one of these I gotta close. That's the problem. There we go. Okay. So just a little bit about, and I'm past that. Okay. This is a beautiful spring coming out of the side of a hill and a glacial deposit in Maine. But anyway, when you talk about aquifer, so. When Paul and I are talking about what I could tell you, I just thought about, so almost everywhere I go, the, the general idea people have is that groundwater is in these large underground pools and that you can actually just drill into them anywhere and find good water. And that some places um, in the United States that's true and other places it's, it's not so true. You happen to be sitting on a, a rock formation called the Waste for River Formation that has average drillage yields greater than 20 gallons per minute, so it's pretty good. So your water's probably pretty hard. But anyway, so it's rock or sediment in a formation, group of formations or part of formation, which is saturated and sufficiently permeable, which means the pores are interconnected, to transmit economic amounts of groundwater. So economic is, can be pretty subjective. <laughs> But basically, it's enough for people to do what they need to do. So the basic of aquifers, if you were thinking about, so here's the soil zone, and then beneath that would be the surficial material or glacial deposits. And then when you get down to a certain level, and this is what you, most people think of, is there's a water table, right? And below the water table, the, the, all the sediments are, are saturated with groundwater. So you call this the saturated zone, this the unsaturated zone. When you get rain, precipitation falling, it soaks in and infiltrates through the soil and it makes its way down through the unsaturated zone um, and then ultimately to the water table and this is what we call groundwater. You can have slightly more complicated situations than just a single type of sediment or soil here but if you have, if you imagine this, you have uh, say this is all sand and this light blue and then this is clay right here. You think about it so the clay does not transmit water as easily 
and so you, the, this actually can be a retard groundwater motion, right? It almost be like a seal, in which case you have an upper aquifer here separated by clays and then a lower aquifer. <coughs> All right, there's some, you all have wells, I assume, right? Mm -hmm. yes. springs. So, or springs. Is every, anyone ever gone out and tried to see what the level of water is in their well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, well, when your water well was being drilled, maybe some of you may have seen, but one of the things that you do, or uh, hydrogeologists do, to, to, to uh, think about how groundwater flows is that if you can imagine like, Imagine that each of you is a well, okay? And then imagine that each of you has a tape, right? That you can lower down, and when it gets to down to the water level, we have, they have these, it's a, they have a sensor, and actually it beeps, right? And when you get to the water table. So if each of you have a tape, and each of you is a well, and you drop your tapes down, right? And it gets to a certain level, like yours is 50 feet below the surface, yours is 100, you whatever. So think about that, so, and think about that you're not just sitting one next to one another, but you're actually, like say, hundreds of yards apart, right, in, in the geometry that you're in this room. So if you lower your tape down and get this level, right, and then your neighbors all, you all talk, and you put all your levels together, and so then you actually say, well, what level is my, my uh, well at, at the ground surface, and then how far down do I lower my tape? So can you see how you'd have a lot of different levels? Well, you're going to make a contour map of that, and that's going to tell you where, which directions groundwater is flowing, and it's going to flow from um, a higher elevation or higher head to towards lower head. So it, you can actually develop contour maps um, of the the quote water table. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to just switch this slide, and then I'm going to. I think I'll do it after, after this. I wanted to point something out, and this is something that uh, most people don't think about, is that when you think about your streams, you always think, well, most people think, a stream is surface water, it's not groundwater, right? Or my lake, it's surface water, not groundwater. Well, it's a, it's a system. The regulatory networks think of groundwater and surface water separately because they have to regulate and protect them. But if you look at this diagram, Here's an example of a gaining stream, right? So here's the stream valley stream, uh, and the stream channel. And in this case, you have, remember the saturated zone, which is below the water table. You have groundwater that's actually coming up and into the stream valley. And this is what we call a gaining stream. But you can also be losing, ground, losing surface water into the aquifer below, and you call that a losing stream. So one of the things that's going on that, and, and this is not just statewide, but it's countrywide and worldwide, is this recognition that groundwater and surface water are a system. Groundwater can become surface water, surface water can become groundwater, and we better try and figure that out because it's, you can't just call it one or the other. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna see if I can get to this little video that I thought was just, uh, I saw it on LinkedIn, and it's just five minutes. We rely on water every day to water lawns, drink, bathe, and cook. But have you ever wondered where that water comes from? Deep underground, water exists in tiny spaces between soil particles. Wells pump water out of the ground, making groundwater available for our use. Wells work a lot like a straw in a glass of ice water. A straw pulls water out from the spaces between ice cubes, just like a well pulls water out from the spaces between soil and rocks. Private well owners aren't the only ones who depend on groundwater. Many cities distribute water to their residents from deep city wells that suck water from around 1,000 feet below ground. But groundwater isn't just valuable when we pump it out of a well. 
It connects directly to many of our lakes and rivers, keeping lakes full and rivers flowing during dry spells. Groundwater refills by gradually soaking into the ground when it rains. The journey water takes through layers of soil and rock is like a filter that removes most impurities. This makes the water drinkable without expensive treatment. However, as we change our landscape, we make important groundwater resources vulnerable to overuse and pollution. To protect our water, it's important to understand how our actions impact both groundwater quantity and quality. Things like buildings and roads block water from soaking into the ground. When our landscape is dominated by these kinds of surfaces, they interrupt the natural refilling process that keeps groundwater plentiful. When you pair this with our agricultural, industrial, and domestic water needs, we can have a significant negative impact on our supply of groundwater. Groundwater works a lot like a bank account. We spend water every day on things like laundry, bathing, and irrigation. Cutting back on wasteful water spending is one of the best ways to maintain a healthy groundwater account. But we still need to make deposits to keep our groundwater account from going to zero. Nature makes a deposit into groundwater when rain is able to soak into the ground. The size and speed of these water deposits is determined by the local land cover, geology, and precipitation. For groundwater to be sustainable, our deposits need to exceed our spending. We can ensure a healthy supply of water for future generations by cutting back on wasteful irrigation and maximizing our groundwater paycheck with tools like rain gardens and protected natural spaces that help water soak into the ground. There are also a lot of things we can do to protect our groundwater quality. Everyone has a role to play in making sure we stop harmful contaminants from getting into the groundwater we all depend on. Groundwater pollution travels in cloud-like formations, often in unpredictable directions and speeds. Since many common groundwater contaminants don't have a taste or odor, you can't be sure your well water is safe without testing. Individual well owners are responsible for making sure their water is safe to drink. Deep municipal wells are often less vulnerable to contamination because pollution needs to travel through multiple layers of sand, rock, and clay to reach the well. Nonetheless, cities are required to regularly test their wells and ensure that the water is safe to drink. By reducing the amount of contaminants we allow to enter the environment and safely disposing of our waste, we can create a cleaner, healthier future for our groundwater. Here in Anoka County, 94% of residents depend on groundwater as their only water source. Our county has high quality groundwater that came from glacial meltwater taking thousands of years to fill our deepest groundwater supplies. However, our large population, high water table, and sandy soils make our groundwater especially vulnerable to overuse and pollution. Understanding groundwater can be overwhelming and complex, but by doing our part to keep groundwater clean and plentiful, we can protect our drinking water for generations to come. So that was Minnesota. And so and where that was made, you notice everything was flat lying, right? Yeah. So like you know, right? so they had they had the glaciers, um, glaciations during roughly the same time period as us, and they have soil and then they have glacial deposits and then they have bedrock. But things tend to be pretty flat lying, right? Like a layer cake. Um, unlike Vermont. But let me just go go into this. So this is where um, countrywide, people think of uh, groundwater as being a simple system. So, has anybody heard of the the, the High Plains Aquifer or the Ogallala Aquifer? Yeah. yeah. So, this is running, and this is a map I got. So, it runs from New Mexico through part of Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, 
and all the way up in Nebraska. And so what it is is basically um, surficial or, or uh, sin or pre-glacial deposits. They're very, very thick. And so the, the water is over hundreds and thousands of years has uh, fallen on the, these permeal deposits and then uh, infiltrated down and we have the High Plains Aquifer that's actually sitting above bedrock, right? So this is why the misconception of that the whole world is composed of these underground oceans of water, um, that's where that comes from. And now I'm just going to either uh, delight you or scare you <laughs> by talking about uh, Vermont. So this is, a, this is a cartoon that I made for our Bennington project, but this is actually gives you a good idea about what things look like underground in Vermont. So in the case of uh, Bennington, you actually had uh, this very hot uh, PFOI chemical coming out into the atmosphere, moving in the atmosphere, and then falling down with rain onto the, onto the soil then percolating down, remember, so this is the unsaturated zone of the cartoons I showed you before, to the surficial aquifer, right, which is in the glacial deposits. Mm -hmm. But then that's connected with the bedrock aquifer. And look what I, I have on here. So this is a fault. This is a fault. These dashed lines are beds. Mm -hmm. And then these dashed lines are cracks or fractures. Mm -hmm. So once things get down to here, you're looking actually at a complex system of connected surfaces. So it's not an ocean, and it, it's not this laterally extensive lake that you think of. It, think about it as it's a three-dimensional lattice of intersecting structures or planes that are transmitting the groundwater. And what I need to do in Vermont with these projects is trying to figure out the best I can where those uh, fractures are, where the beds are, where the folds are, where the faults are, so I know the options for how groundwater is moving. And so I've had different people come up to me. At, at, um, I've presented this stuff at conferences quite a bit. And I had one gentleman at, um, in 2017 came up to me and he said, he said, why do you even try? It's hopeless. It's too complex. I said, no, we can figure stuff out. And then the other people come up and they say, you know, thanks for taking this on. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a noble task and all that. But um, I just want to show you, I'm going to build a little bit of the story about how we do things. And I, I'm, not going to, I'm not going to show all of it to you. But so if you want to start to understand aquifers, there's two different sides to this, right? One is what we call the physical side, and the other is called the chemical side. And this is what this group that I've been working with, um, some of them for uh, 18 years, some of them for just five years, but um, uh, at, at uh, colleges and universities. So the physical side is basically, how can we determine what's underneath our feet by making maps? And so in Woodbury um, and all this, or on a lot of this area, We've made, bed, made bedrock maps, like the ones behind, like there. And we made surficial or glacial deposit maps right there. And then remember I was talking about, imagine that this was the town of Woodbury, essentially, and all of you are wells. We can get most of that information, right? And we have information on the individual wells, how deep they are, how much uh, soil there's on top of the bedrock, how much yield the well, uh, water the wells are producing. So we can put that together in three dimensions and, and make some um, maps. Like remember I was talking, you make a groundwater contour map. You can make a, a map of the thickness of the glacial deposits. And then uh, one thing I'll just, I'm gonna kinda end with is just showing you a few examples of geophysical well logging where you're lowering very expensive tools down wells one at a time and getting a huge amount of information about each well. And I'll show you an example of that. So this talk is really going to concentrate on the physical side, mostly about the geologic mapping, the spatial analysis of wells, and I'll just touch on geophysical well logging. This whole chemical side, that's uh, another story, but basically what you want to do is you have this three-dimensional physical model that you develop, and then you use different tracers, like whatever the contaminant du jour is, 
You use the chemistry of the water, you use the isotopes in the water, which isotopes are uh, basically compounds that have the same number of protons but different number of neutrons. And then we can actually date the water in terms of its recharge age. But so I'm just going to talk about this side of things. Oh, I just want to point out the, where you live. So here I am, I'm up on uh, Owl's Head in uh, Groton State Park, and there's Kettle Pond. And so I'm standing in on top of one of these big granite bodies uh, right here. But then look into the valley. Here's the Connecticut Valley rocks, essentially the Waits River that you all um, live in, mostly. And you can see that this is essentially steep, but um, pretty much rolling hills. Then here's this wall of the Green Mountains, which is essentially the older, higher rocks that make a continuous ridge. I just wanted to point out the topography. And then you all know about, like Marshfield Mountain, th this is actually a granite pluton, or think of, a, uh, it was a bulb-shaped um, intrusion of granite into the crust. And once it was eroded onto the surface, by the release of pressure during erosion, essentially you're, you're getting flaking off like uh, the uh, layers of an onion. But here we go. Okay, so let's just talk about the geology. Oh, that's, just, that's not very clear, but it'll... So I'm just going to talk about... Ver I'll just give you a little bit about Vermont geology. So over here in Burlington, if you go Christmas shopping in Burlington, <laughs> This is all basically sedimentary rocks that have been weakly metamorphosed, okay? Which should change by temperature and pressure. And then this belt, and so think about this. So these rocks are on the bottom of a series of basically big slices where this is on top of that, that's on top of that, and that's on top of that, right? On a, on a pretty big scale, right? So Vermont is, a, a joke, the size of Texas is just sitting on its side because, <laughs> because if you look at the, if you look at the, we've got one, two, three, four, five, six major what we call lithologic belts in Vermont and what's the widest part of Vermont? Well, not even 50 miles, so it's, uh, it's pretty amazing. We, we've got an amazing geology in a, in a short area. So anyway, so these were the, the uh, Weakly metamorphosed sedimentary rocks. The Green Mountain slice here is on top of that. The Roll Holly slice is on top of that. And then um, here's your town in the, the yellow square. And so you, you are mostly in the Connecticut Valley rocks right here. But you just go across what we call the, the uh, well, it's the Richmond, Richardson Memorial Contact, which is um, a Silurian or about 420 million year old unconformity where after one mountain building event the rocks were eroded for a long period of time before you deposit the next uh, set of rocks on top so the when you go up just uphill towards Worcester when you take the the Worcester mountain road you're going actually into the Moortown formation which is part of the, the older rocks and then right along between where you just get up high, uh, think of near uh, Maple Corners. And so when you're getting up high above Maple Corners, you're in the older rocks, and then um, downhill from Maple Corners, you're getting into the, uh, the, uh, the younger rocks. So these are 460 million years and older. These are, say, 420 to 390 million years. Did those come from North Africa? No. No, that, the African issue, so, yeah, that's going to take me an hour. <laughs> <laughs> that's what they told me in school. <laughs> that, that's, that's, not, that's not Africa. We, we can talk about some about Africa in terms of the Atlantic Ocean formed from uh, essentially rifting Africa away from North America, South America, okay? But um, there are debates about some pieces of Africa being up in the main area, but not certainly not over here. So let me just go to a blow up of this map. So here's the map. So 
underneath this is basically the topography that's shaded, right? So you can actually see where it's steep and where it's not. Well, can you see right here? Can you see the shadows up here, right here? So it's, it's dark and shadowy here because that's steeper. Yeah. And then right where you get across this uh, <coughs> fault or unconformity, faulted unconformity, then the terrain gets to be more rolling. And so here's the younger rocks, here's the older rocks. And I'm just going to skip that. So one of the things, and you're saying, well, what does this have to do with hydro hydrogeology? Well, so when we look at the bedrock map, we need to look about and think about what are the lithologies? What are the rock formations? Are they, are they formations that, for example, if you have a lot of uh, calcium carbonate, there used to be limestone, like in the Waits River, you can develop secondary porosity from groundwater moving through those rocks and dissolving them over uh, millennia. So it's important to think about the lithologies, where are there used to be limestones, where they're not, and then the structures. So you've noticed that when you drive around town, nothing's flat lying, right? It's all standing on end. And it's standing on end because of two major uh, folding events. About 300, 375 million years ago and about 360 million years ago. So, but if we start to think about that, so which way are the beds dipping? Which are the, the way are the foliations dipping? So the foliations form when you fold rocks. You actually, if you take this and you fold it, you tend to get minerals that will align bisecting the fold. And that would be what you call a foliation. And then folds, if you think about it, if you have a fold, one side of the fold, water might tend to flow one way versus the other way. Faults, faults are zones where you end up having one plate moved over the other and often they can be conduits for groundwater because that it's easy to dissolve um, the minerals along that. And then fractures or cracks, which are everywhere. And these are forming probably, uh, we're talking 120 million years ago and, and younger. So the cracks are the youngest things, but also may be the most important for water. This is the Waits River Formation. So this is actually, it's in, it's in Calus. But what I want to show you, and this is kind of the, the uh, one of the guide formations to your town, is that you see that in brown right here? These are the marbles. These are sandy marbles that were once limestones in this ancient ocean. Here are shaley layers that are now called phyllites because of the metamorphism. They're a little shiny. And can, you can see here you've got thick uh, marble layers. So that's one thing to think about. So when you have um, wells with a lot of, uh, produce a lot of water, it's because you end up being able to dissolve out along these marbles mm -hmm. and if there's, if there's that much marble all your water is going to be hard unless you live up higher right I mean so <clears throat> there's no way around that but this formation is one one of the most prolific formations in the state for producing groundwater and is that your notebook Yes. <laughs> I still use a notebook. Some people do everything. Okay. And then just east of your town is a formation called the uh, Guyamon Formation, which is, this is quartzite, and then this is actually phyllite or shaley rock. So this used to be a sandstone. And then this used to be a shale in this ancient ocean about, say, 400 to 380 million years ago. There, there's none of that in your town, but it's just to the east of you. And then you've all probably been to the Woodbury Granite Quarry, which is a spectacular quarry. But I like to show this in, uh, have you ever been to the Rock of Ages Quarry in Barrie? for a tour or whatever. So with special permission, you can go up to the top of the quarry. When, when they first started quarrying down and the granite was of poor quality for making perfect uh, uh, cubes and, and pr prisms, they had to go through what was waste rock. 
And so what you see here is, and this is, I think this is one of the most spectacular things I've ever seen. So here, here's uh, my colleagues right here. There's the humans. And so you see all the white rock around, that's all granite. Look at this. These are big pieces, twice the size of school buses of the surrounding Waits River that actually were torn off the walls of the pipe or conduit or f fell in from above when this granite came into the crust about 360 million years ago. So think about that in terms of the scale. But one of the important things about the granites in terms of groundwater, look at these cracks. There's cracks here, so as this granite erodes, it, it actually, remember I was talking about like layers of an onion? So you see how closely spaced they are up here and, the, and then the onion layers get farther and farther apart. And then you see cracks in here. So granites can often be pr pretty prolific for groundwater. And then this is on, uh, this is on Route 2 uh, near Danville. But I show this, I mean, you actually have all of this beautiful folding, uh, but it's not along roads in uh, Woodbury. But I just want to point out to you, so you think about, remember I was talking about, well, if you had flat lying layers, everything would be pretty simple, right? But look at this. We've taken the layers and we folded them like this into these, uh, basically, these, these tight folds. But you start to look around here and you can actually see that it looks like there are places, like look right here. See that? You're actually folding an earlier fold. So there, you've got two generations of folds in here. This, these are a bunch of students, uh, interns, um, one from University of Vermont and then actually a colleague and uh, his student from the University of Quebec at Montreal. And then here's the fracture story. So here's the, basically the phyllites. Remember the shaley rocks I was talking about in the Waits River Formation? But look at these cracks. Just here, 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 here. Well, we can measure these over basically hundreds of square miles and find out what are the orientations and then what might may think about in terms of how the groundwater flows along cracks of those orientations. So I'm trying to build a story. So what were the rocks? Um, what is their chance of dissolving and developing secondary porosity? What are the folds? What are the faults? And all that doing. So if I can keep, start to keep track of all that stuff, I can start thinking about how groundwater might move through a complicated situation. Oh. Yeah, I'm going to go right here to the surficial map of, uh, this is done by my colleague George Springston from uh, Norwich University, who's worked with, for us, with us for 20, 20 years. But here's, here's uh, now this is the southern two-thirds of the to uh, town of Woodbury. I'm um, southern two-thirds of the Woodbury Quadrangle, which actually <coughs> contains this part of Woodbury, some of Callis, and then some of Worcester up here. But one of the things about, so now adding to the bedrock, what's on top of the bedrock? The glacial deposits? Well, if you start to look at the, the, the type of deposits in here in the purple and here in the um, pink, you start to see that right around Sabin Pond and all there and around some of these other ponds, you've got really sandy, gravelly deposits, right? And so sandy, gravelly deposits, if you think about if water is percolating through there, it's going to go right through. So now we're starting to have a story of what type of rock did we have, how was it folded and, and faulted, and then what type of deposits are on top. And this is just a superb figure and that my colleague George and Stephen Wright from um, University of Vermont have been working together too. But So this is the, basically the LIDAR map of this part of Vermont. And LIDAR is essentially the really detailed, it's called light detection and ranging. And so you can actually get sub-centimeter accuracy on the elevation of, of millions of points in, in a given area. And so then what you do is you take this and in, the, in the geographic information software, you can then ask it and say, tell me where 
the slope is the steepest and I'm going to make that black and where it's the, the gentlest it'll be white but if you look at here how this comes out it's just amazing so here it is the Northfield Mountains south of Waterbury here's Waterbury then here's the Worcester Range here you are up here here's, remember that uh, when I was talking about the contact between the old rocks and the new rocks younger rocks look at it it appears actually almost as a cliff and you see that in your town you can go find this this is the old rocks, this is the younger rocks. And using that, the LiDAR shape, what we call shaded relief, that using all their data, they figured out where exactly this old glacial lake Winooski was. Mm. And, it, and, and, and I, I gotta tell you, so I mean, you may not be as excited as me, but <laughs> this is the most accurate map of the le glacial lake levels that's ever been produced. It's so neat. So if you think about this, so all along the interstate was all glacial lake. The ice was over near Burlington, the, the glacier, approximately right here, and it was basically damming up the Winooski, uh, Lamoille, and Missisquoi valleys, right? The ice was there and they just filled up like bathtubs. So here you have this lake extended up Route 100 to Morrisville, where I live, and then all the way out towards, um, um, Hardwick. well, towards Hardwick over here, but also to uh, Elmore State Park. Mm -hmm. And then, so anyway, this is really neat. But this is having this map that shows that the geometry of all these deposits gives you an idea. So where are the deposits that might be holding or transmitting the water? So it's all just building a story. So if we start to think about the, the surficial deposits, the glacial deposits, it, it, it makes sense that you would want to think what type of composition are there? Is it sand? Is it clay? Right? What are the grain size? That's sand, clay, boulder, gravel. How thick are they, right? So how much thickness would the water have to, water falling as rain have to infiltrate through to get to the water table and in all these projects I'm working on with, with contamination we think about so how thick are the deposits and what potential do they have to retard the motion of groundwater carrying the contaminant as it moved downward so and then this all relates to the porosity and permeability how, how many pores are in the, these deposits and then how connected are the pores so I'll just show you a few Example, some are from near here, some are not, but, okay. Yeah, okay, there we go. So, ice contact deposits, these are sitting between the valley wall and the melting glacier, and you have gravel deposits, you have spectacular gravel deposits in town. This is one actually up near Lunenburg, where this was a field trip I went on years ago. But you can see the beds in there, and this is all sand. And so this is related, this is near the sides of the valleys, just like here, where the glacier was melting, and the water melting off the glacier was sorting and rounding and moving the sediment around in specific locations. Here is, this, this uh, outcrop is no longer there. But this is actually at uh, Little River State Park. You have varve clays in uh, the valley near uh, in Callis and Woodbury, but they're not as quite as uh, amazing as these in the sense of how well defined they are. So if you know the story about varves in glacial lakes, so during the winter, you develop, because the lake was frozen over, you end up with basically fi very fine-grained clays and silts depositing, right? And that's the dark layers. When the lake, glacial lake would melt in the spring and summer, it would allow more energy because wind energy and all that and erosion of uh, the surrounding uh, highlands and then you would get sandy layers. So you end up with clay, winter, sand, clay, winter, sand. And so every one of these is a year. And so my uh, colleague Stephen from University of Vermont, I, I, he went out there with a tape measure. He measured, I think, close to 200 years. Um, and so you think about that 200 years, I mean, um, it's kind of neat to be able to see things that clearly and discreetly. 
And I've been out there with kids uh, a bunch, anywhere from, say, sixth grade down to third grade. And what I had them do at the time, this was a while ago, I had them actually count my age on these. And so at the time, I was about 40. And so it was a lot. And they were going, whoa. <laughs> but, but anyway, if you look at this, so one thing to think about with these, remember I was talking about porosity and permeability. So if you're talking about these that are um, silty, really silty layers or clay layers, they're going to retard water flow. So when you tend to have these things, they tend to actually be in some instances like, like saran wrap sitting on whatever they're below. Or, and so they don't transmit water as readily. <laughs> and here's just some of the garden variety uh, normal glacial till, which is essentially, uh, it can be sand, silt, and clay, unsorted, and then big um, angular pieces of the surrounding rock. So the till, if you remember the story, as the glaciers were melting, the, um, they were indiscriminate, right? So if you thought about all this sand, silt, clay, boulders, whatever in the ice, when it melts, it just drops to where it is. The water's not sorting it at all. So all the highlands are, you know, away from the river valleys tend to be composed of till. So getting into the, the, the kind of the second last stop Oh, the last step I'm going to um, discuss in detail. So when you have a, a well driller come out, essentially all you know, well, I know because I've been in people's yards when they're drilling, because it's actually like a cash register ringing. So the deeper they go, <laughs> don't, I mean, they'll run, they'll run out and talk to the driller, and they'll and oh, keep going, keep going, then go back. But anyway, because, so, you know, it's, they charge by the foot. But here's putting in some wells uh, for one of our projects in East Montpelier. So what use would these be? And this is what use they are. Remember I was talking about if every one of you is a well spaced all out around town? This is in Bennington. So this type of report is available for every well since the 70s. So if you think about it, we've got tens of thousands of reports um, of individual wells in the state. The only problem is that they're not all accurately located. The pre-GPS, the global positioning system, they weren't, they weren't as good a quality. But anyway, so here's a well drilled a year ago down in Bennington. The address, the name, the exact latitude and longitude. And then it tells you uh, how much soil there is above, how much bedrock they drilled into, what was the yield of the well, et cetera, right? So that's one point, right? And here's uh, Alexander from Bennington College. So this, these are all the chips that came out of that one well. So you can actually get a, you know what formation type rock is actually coming out in this pile from a, this 300 foot well. So it's not just this. We know what the rock looked like and then we have these reports. And we can start to put this all together. And this is for the town of Callis. So you're, you're obviously right in here. We did this, back, I think, in 2016, just putting the data together. So remember what I was talking about? All the wells that could be accurately located in Callis are shown as dots of different colors, right? Mm -hmm. Then every dot is coded by color and size. So. These are all wells drilled into bedrock. But if you look at the scale here, the lower yields in gallons per minute are in the reds and the orange, yellow, and the highest yields are shown in green. And I, you can't see the scale, but here, the green dots, the biggest dots, that's 20 gallons per minute to 150 gallons per minute. So in the Waits River Formation, which is this uh, slightly darker blue and then lighter blue, basically most of the wells are averaging more than 20 gallons per minute. So you're in, you're in some pretty good formations for producing, for producing groundwater. That's, and from using the wells and the rock types, this is the type of map that we, that we can make. And then here's another example. And so look at this. This has got the LIDAR shaded relief under it. Remember, so the steeper it is, 
the darker the, the uh, shading and then the gentler it is the lighter the shading but what this is doing is showing you areas where the um, surficial deposit or glacial deposits are thickest so basically in and around the route 14 valley right here you have um, thick deposits that are greater than 100 feet right so because of all the well information so each one has the depth of bedrock and we know the elevation of the well we can figure out what the, we call this an isopack map but what is the thickness of the glacial deposits all around a whole, whole geographic area and I mean if the last thing is uh, this has really been a lot of fun for me I have uh, so we can actually tell an enormous amount about each well by pulling the pump and equipment out of the well, letting the well settle, and then we can actually lower down a series of tools. Starting with a camera that gives us spectacular, I mean only geologists think it's a spectacular video. <laughs> <laughs> I mean if you, if you come in, if you, if you come up to my office, we'll be sitting around my monitor going, whoa, look, at this. you're seeing, you know, the camera going down, but it's telling you all about the walls of the, then you can lower a, a temperature and salinity probe, and then a gamma probe, which is measuring the natural radioactivity of the rocks, a caliper probe that gives you the diameter of the hole, then an acoustic televiewer would actually use radar energy to actually make a three-dimensional uh, image of the inside of the hole. And the last thing is a heat pulse flow meter, which actually gives you what direction groundwater is moving in the, in the well, and then at what velocity. So what I'm just going to talk about here is a little bit of this and a little bit of this. How much does that camera cost? <laughs> this stuff, that's 15000 oh, okay. and this is 100000 I was thinking of using them for milk oil checks. <laughs> I think that's overkill. <laughs> but you're not going to do it in a, in a well. So this is actually from three wells in East Montpelier. And I just want to show you, this is the Waits River Formation. So this is at 16.5 meters, so that's 53 feet about. And so look at it. So here's the layers of rock, right? You see intersecting the borehole. Here is a pump. We, we put a pump down the hole and we pumped out all the water and then we followed it down with a camera. So we were looking at a basically an evacuated well, no, no water in it. But here what you can see is here are layers or we think are beds in the rock and you can see water just flowing into the hole. And that's the only, that was the only place at, at 16.5 meters the water is flowing in. Here this well, um, a neighboring well at 108 feet. The water was screaming in just along one of these beds. This was an area of nitrate contamination, so we wanted to know what we, whatever we could about the wells. And then this is actually what I've been talking about with the way it's river formation all along. So look at here. This is six inches in diameter, right? But as you look at the whole photo, you're looking at much greater than six inches in diameter, right? It's a cave, and it's where one of these... Uh, limestones or marbles has been eroded around, out by um, groundwater over decades and decades or maybe hundreds of years and here's the, the well but as you're coming down you go into a cave and this was where the water was coming into the hole and then you go down below and the cave is gone so so, those, so the people missing that water that water isn't no, and it wouldn't. Well, because you put a pipe in there, or? No, so just think about so. Oh, no, no, no. All right, so here's, here's a well, yeah. right? And so you think about coming down from the top, it's just you're going uh, uh, six inches in diameter, six inches in diameter. But then you get to a place where this is all a cave, right? Yeah. And then you're looking down below, and so here it is, then a cave, and then back down, and here's where the water's coming in. So it's well, actually... Okay. Well casing doesn't go all the way down. No, okay, the, the deal with well casing is, in general what they do, when they get down to bedrock drillers, they'll go at least about 10 more feet. And so so that, that you really need to have your well sealed from the possible effects of surface water getting in, so they go at least uh, 10 feet into bedrock. 
In some places where there are, there are worries about contamination, they may go quite deep mm -hmm. to try and seal off um, any shallow sources or avenues of contamination. And this I want to show because this is, remember I was talking about the Waits River Formation, so it's shale, limestone, shale, limestone, shale, limestone, or now we call them marble and phyllite. <laughs> but if we, if we go down this well right here, this is actually a, a, a 600 foot deep well, okay? Wow. And this was in Berlin, but it's the same Waits River Formation, so it, rocks have an a natural gamma ray signature. Now this isn't, you know, worrisome levels of radioactivity. Basically what's the rocks that have more <coughs> potassium will emit more gamma rays, right? And so if we actually put that story together for, so look at this. This is a 600 foot well. So as you're going down, look. High gamma, shale. Low gamma, limestone. High gamma, Shale, low gamma limestone. So we can figure out exact thicknesses going down 600 feet of what the different rock types are. And in this well, I can tell you that every place where groundwater was coming in was right at a boundary between a, sh a marble and a shale. So that there's, there's a lot you can tell. Why, why did they drill that so deep? Was that because you wanted that information? Or oh, no, no. This is actually um, one of the three wells that the town of Berlin drilled in reserve in case they needed it. Oh. And now they're, 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 these wells are actually uh, online, the town's using them. So this was like five years ago that we did this. So the wells were sitting um, unused and then they uh, were finally hooked up because they were needed. So this is information we got um, in the kind of dead zone period be before they hooked them up. And then, um, this is uh, my last slide, and because I didn't want to go into the geophysical logging too much, but I, I just want to show you what you can tell. So, if, here's the hole, okay, going from shallow to deep, okay, here's the gamma in red. So look what happens here, as you go down here, high gamma, high gamma, high gamma, high gamma, low gamma, right here, right here, is here is the acoustic televiewer log. So what it's showing is that where it's brown, the rock is less dense. Where it's yellow, it's more dense or more competent. So you can actually see, look at the layering in here. Now this is a shaley quartzite right here with higher gamma. Here is a major fault. And then here you go into limestones mm -hmm. below. And let me just point these out. So here are these rusty, um, Shaley quartzites going down. Here's the fault right here where you go from the rusty shaley quartzites into the limestone down here in tan. And then right down here, here is a nearly vertical fracture. Remember I talked in the fractures with the youngest mm -hmm. surfaces to think about? Mm -hmm. All the water was coming in along that fracture. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the reason you might care is that what we found out is that below this thrust fault, water that was actually very old, greater than 70 years old, was coming up along this fracture and I had no contaminant PFOA in it. So if, if you start to look at what I've tried to do is so map the rocks, the rock types, and the different structures, the folds, the faults, the uh, fractures, map the, the glacial deposits and think about their composition, their porosity and permeability, then look at the context of all the wells in a given area and then make your maps from that. And then the last, you can actually start using some of the fancy tools to actually fig figure out really detailed things about wells. And so m my uh, colleague and I in Bennington, we did 17 wells in uh, that area and, and it really helped understand the plumbing that, uh, that I call it in terms of the, where it was contaminated, where it wasn't and, and why that was. So. Um, if you have two more hours, I'll go into the chemical, <laughs> but I'm not, no, I'm done. <laughs> Maybe not this time. <laughs> no, I get it, I get it, I totally get it. So the, I'll just take any questions or whatever he has. Yeah, I have a question. Somebody sent me an email um, saying that 
you know, about the, you know, they saw the postings, but said, well, there are no aquifers in, in Woodbury. And, and I'm thinking after what you said that they're thinking about there's no big underground lake. But the aquifer is all the water that's in our, our rock formations, right? R right. So, so, <laughs> so the deal is, is that, and then I try to present that. So it's a misnomer so in this part of the country and every places where there's been all these folding, faulting, and mountain building events that the water is in continuous underbomb uh, horizontal bodies of water. It's, it's in and along the structures, whether they be beds or faults or cracks and fractures in the rock, and they're often connected, right? And so, but you're thinking, about, some of you are thinking, Nah, you can't figure that out. But but well, we can, yeah. and we've done it. We we're actually in uh, working in Rutland at the Rutland Airport. We're actually seeing some of the same type of relationships with old water with particular chemistry coming up from the bottom of really deep wells. So anyway, the, yeah. So think about it. In the in Vermont, there aren't many surficial aquifers where there's you know big bodies of water in the the glacial deposits. There are some places like Middlebury. They have to have a pretty prolific surficial aquifer. Down in uh, Brandon, they have places with that. But I, I got one. In in the sands and gravels. Yeah, when when Chevalier showed up to drill, he said, yeah. "This is gonna be a gravel well." No way. Uh, Sixty-two feet, sixty gallons. Mm -hmm. Even getting into the ledge. No, well, that, that's that's certainly possible. One one of the things that, one of the things you have to worry about with or think about at least with uh, the surficial uh, or gravel wells is that they can tend to have um, uh, be more predisposed to getting contaminated yep. because they aren't essentially sealed with casing off mm -hmm. from the uh, the above deposits and bedrock. I don't even have that of a spring, and the water seems to be pretty good. <laughs> But then there's only two houses on my road. I was spraying that people across the street had had their well redrilled numerous times to try to get enough water. So they're just not hitting that vertical crack, I guess, that they need or something. I don't know. But it's interesting. So. I could be that. And so the water. thing is, that, like, I can give you lots of information on the well. Like, for example, I can't tell you that your well is going to be better than hers. But I can tell you in a formation by statistics what your chances are of having, essentially having uh, a favorable outcome. And so the and answer, well, if you saw all the wells in your town, or actually those are in Calus, but you have the same formations that um, your chances of having a pretty good well in the Waits River formation are good. And if you live in West Woodbury, not so good. Well, but I, I'm not saying it's not, it's not that it's not so good. It's that those rocks tend to be more like quartzites and they, they might not, on average, contain as much water. Did you say you could tell how old the water is? Yeah, so that's the, uh, <laughs> that's the long, okay, so, uh, okay, I'll give you the drive-through explanation. And so there are compounds in the Earth's atmosphere, starting with um, atomic bomb testing. So um, even though in the 1940s, obviously you know about there were, used in World War II in 1945. But the amount of tritium, which is a, uh, basically a byproduct of atomic explosions, didn't start to rise in the atmosphere from later testing until 1953. So some of the wells I was talking about in Bennington where I was saying the water is old, it means they had no tritium in it. Mm. So if it has no tritium, it has to be pre-1953. Oh. But then you can also use other compounds. So you're very happy about having air conditioning and refrigerators, right? I am. But the first refrigerators and air conditioners use... Um, yeah. Ammonia. Well, the ones I'm thinking, the chlorinated fluorocarbons, that oh, yeah. they call oh, free, free on. <laughs> Yeah. So those compounds, because of their, their properties, were great for refrigerants. They actually remove heat. So back in the 40s, when you started making refrigerators, then later air conditioners, you start to put those compounds into the atmosphere just collaterally. As, yeah. And so at different places on, on the surface of the earth, so there's one in Colorado, South America, Hawaii, Europe, they're measuring those, those gases. And they can actually look 
you can look at these curves and you see how much of these chlorinated fluorocarbons are in your sample compare with what was in the atmosphere at that time and it gives you um, an age. So how old is the water we're drinking here? In um, the only thing, I, you know, I, I don't know for sure, but I, I can say that the work that we did in East Montpelier, the water was around 20 years old. But that, and that's an average, it's basically an average of the different water ages that are mixing together. But anyway, so if you thought about it, you wouldn't think that it was 20 years old, right? <laughs> Come out on average. So you, you learn all these different qualities about an aquifer and, a, and the well bores in a, in a location where there's contamination. Is there, does it give you any idea how to remediate that contamination? Is there anything you can do? Well, the, there's some of the contaminants they talk about um, um, neutralizing or, or you know, uh, destroying it with uh, certain remediation techniques. The PFOA at the, uh, in Bennington and the similar compounds at Rutland Airport, they're so soluble. I mean, they're designed to be soluble. They're, they're amazing, amazing for what they were designed to do. They don't dissolve, and they don't, I mean, they dissolve easily, and they don't break down. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, is that with these perfluorinated alkyl substances, you're hearing about them. If, if you were to actually look, Vermont Digger last week, they were talking about, they're working on rules for these PFOS compounds mm -hmm. on, on how, to, um, how to regulate them, and then which ones they should regulate. So there's like 4,000 PFOS compounds, but only a handful of them that are actually regulated. So, and so the, the remediation of the, those type of compounds, my understanding, they're working on it, but it's not promising. And then some other compounds, um, uh, like a PC and TC from dry cleaners, they have some success in destroying it with strong oxidizing agents. And also some with uh, bacteria um, that that actually preferentially eats this stuff. This stuff. But um, but then if you think about natural contaminants like um, arsenic, arsenic you can treat. You know that'll come out. Basically, a water softener won't remove arsenic, but a basically it's, it's a it's a filter composed of basically iron filings that hold on to the arsenic. Arsenic, I, I, I'm not saying that there's an arsenic problem here. That, uh, we haven't, we tested a whole bunch of wells around and we never found any high arsenic. But I'm just telling you that other things in drinking water, like uranium, that can be removed either with a reverse osmosis filters or with an anion exchange. So normal water softeners are ex exchanging sodium for the different metals in solution. And then you back flush it and then recharge it with sodium. Um, if you use anion exchange instead of um, instead of having sodium on there, you actually have chloride on there, and to exchange. So in terms of you know most contaminants, you can filter them out. I mean, it, a water softener will remove a lot of stuff. I think a lot of uh, municipalities outlaw backwashing. Um, I don't know if they I, want to have as much. But some jurisdictions they don't. Well, there was a problem with backwashing uh, these industrial water softeners with uranium for a while because the uranium that comes off the, essentially the filter resin actually concentrates in the, can concentrate in the, the muds and stuff or, um, where it's flushed to. But I can't, I, I can't speak about the regulation. I think, I think you mentioned that in some cases where you have the contamination, if you drill deeper down, you're getting some better, more pure water. So is that a solution of run casing down further and get, getting a better quality of water that's not contaminated? Um, okay, in a, in a general sense, you could say deeper is better, but basically um, it's not always the case. But in, in a general sense, in an area where there's no contamination, like for example, um, I've talked to drillers, and they say so. In an area where there's nitrate contamination from from farming or something, that what they would do is inst 
and remember I was talking about you'll drill down and then you'll case you know 10 or 20 feet into bedrock and that seals you from the effects of surface water at least but what they'll do is actually they'll drill down um, past the first water producing horizon or the first layers producing water and they'll keep going to the next one and then they'll case all the way down past the first water producing horizon so in terms of the deeper is a possibly a solution with the, the, the engineering solution with casing that that's possible the Oklahoma that's uh, supposed to be getting depleted and not replenished isn't it yeah, the, in fact, the, the, if, you, if you just uh, Google uh, Ogallala Aquifer in the New York Times or Washington Post, they had, some, they had some great articles on it, and over the course of a single person's lifetime, having the water level drop 200 feet. Wow. In the Imperial, uh, in the Imperial Valley in California, that's dropped, what, about 30 feet? Uh, I don't know, but so the thing is, is I thought that the, the little video the little cartoon is actually, it is, it's, it's like a bank you're putting money into, and if you take more out, then you don't have any. So remember the drought in California a few years ago? That was because there wasn't any snow in the Sierras. You didn't, you didn't have it to melt, and then so you're in big drought problems. But now they ended up with just epic skiing, you know, a few years later, where the, 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 the chairlifts at some of the ski areas actually had to shovel them out. They had so much snow, and then that <laughs> replenished the, uh, I mean, at least temporarily replenished the, the aquifers. I remember seeing a picture in the Central Valley of California where the actual ground level went down like 20 feet because they were taking so much water out. Yeah, that's still happening in, in places, right? Because there's no, I mean, if you th think about it, so if there's water in the ground, it's actually resisting depression because <laughs> right. water's not compressible. Mm -hmm. But once you take that out, you're just going to start to... Yeah, so the, the, around the Ogallala Aquifer or the High Plains Aquifer, if you read about it, they say that, you know, sometimes the, the, the ground is subsiding around these major water withdrawals. That's, that's because of the agriculture, isn't it, the irrigation? Um, well, yeah, a lot of it's, some of it's from industry, I mean, it's... And that when the ground compresses like that, after the water comes out, if you then get more water, is that, I mean, you've changed the geology of the area now, right? You wouldn't necessarily fill that same area up because it's not compressed, or would you? Fill well, if you if you ran the cycle of the the uh, the cartoon uh, over, and you get more and more uh, rainfall and infiltration, and then working its way down, that you can replenish that. But I think one of the one of the lessons that, that I've really learned a lot in the past 15 years working with this is that groundwater flow is not f fast, and it's not what you. Think it is so. For example, in this one study that we did in East Montpelier, okay, these are you know <clears throat> ballpark calculations, but we were getting uh, groundwater flow rates in the bedrock aquifer just a couple centimeters per day. And so I'm not saying it can't be faster, and I can't and could be slower, but if you're thinking about that, that that's you know a decade or so to go very far. And so when you're talking about a contamination problem or whatever, it's not going to abate as quickly as you would want. So if something happens in a contaminated area, so for example, the farmer changes his practices, or they change whatever practice related to a company or whatever. Um, if it happens this, uh, this uh, spring, by the late spring, it's not, I mean, you're talking about this this is going to take years to yeah a lot longer than you think but i think sarah was saying when the when the ground compresses down like the 20 feet drop or the three foot drop or whatever because the water's been withdrawn and then you get a lot of rain it doesn't no you could you could you could essentially quote inflate it back up some and, and man, it's, it's like when you, when you, you know when you dig a ditch in your backyard, and then you fill it in, and then you look at it a, f a few weeks later, you go, geez, I thought that was all the way, I mean, because so once you have su subsidence, yeah, yeah, you may not recover all the way, but. Right. That's interesting. Could I talk you into doing a sketch on the board for us of a cross-section of the bedrock, east-west cross-section? 
through here, what it might be looking like. That's what. That's it right there. So that, at the bottom? Yeah. And so, the Wake River is diving under the Moore Town? Is that what that is? is yeah, so if you look at it right now, so if this is... Oh, I'm going to do this. So we'll make, we'll make this west, right? So the Moore Town's on the east, the Waits River's... The Moore Town's on the west. There's the Moore Town on the west. And, it's older. But, yeah, so yeah. But, but right now, the, the Waits River, because as everything's dipping west right there, the Moore Town is on top, is, is in current day on top of the Waits River. But the Waits River is much younger. And the reason it is that at earlier in, in history, say about 375 million years ago, the Moore Town, well, the, the way, I got to get this in terms of the, so if this is the Moore Town, it was pushed, it was once it's now like this, but previously it was dipping the other way, okay, and the Waits River was pushed over that, but then it was folded back. Mm. Is it a, a fold that is flopped over or something? Is yeah, so if you look at the folds that I put in the cross section, they're the ones that do this. That's the set from 360 million years old that took the original orientation at 375 and then flopped it over. So it just folded it back. Yeah, so the the, um, the dark blue there, the Richardson, what is it, fault or whatever it is. The well, just, let's just call it, let's call it the Dog River Fault Zone. Or, yeah, that dark blue is. Here's on my, the Moore Town. It's, it's on my property. Right. And it's fillite, and the beds are like straight up and down. Right. So anyway, here here's the Moore Town, which is the green uh, shaley quartzites that are going up uphill to this steep zone right here and so and then here's the Waits River right now to the east and under it but this has actually been rotated back through the vertical so it was initially like this when the fault was forming but then the second fold generation folded it back yeah, like that yeah <laughs> <laughs> no really it's just tipping it back through the vertical that second fold, that second fold generation Sell. <laughs> the house isn't on that formation. The house is on. No, this, the, 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 the back folding was 360 million years yeah, ago. Right. That UVM um, geologists has dated those those mm -hmm. folds by the biotite micas associated with that folding, oh, really? and they're 360 million years mm -hmm. old. Wow. How thick is the Waits River formation in this neck of the woods? Um, well, it goes way over to here, and you think that it's all folded. I mean, it's going, I mean, from your diagram, it looks like it's going to go down and then bend back up and come over in New Hampshire, or Connecticut River. Bend. Well, the Waits, the Waits River goes then into the Guile Mountain, and then there's the Meeting House Slate, and then some of the, it, as you go into the um, New Hampshire, correlative rocks to these are over there, too. If I, if I had the Vermont State Map with me, you would actually... You can actually see this is part of this big basin. And in New Hampshire, the Moortown rocks come back up as the Dead River and Albee Formation mm -hmm. on the other side of the state. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the, so even though I've got it drawn here, I just and, and the cross section is going to you know, a depth of 2,000 feet. So when you're thinking about many thousand feet, these rocks that are actually dipping like this were once like this and then go under this and then come back up. Um, Near New Hampshire, and you're laughing. <laughs> no, it's true. No. But, no, we can tell from uh, from the, the mapping, the measuring the formations, uh, dip strikes and dips, and also uh, by uh, dating the the micas. I know the state map is online. So yeah. Go, go look at it yourself. Mm -hmm. Or get yourself your, your maybe the the library needs a copy. These maps are actually on the town website as well. Okay. Oh, really? you want to, like, come in or come. So all this granite up here in the hill, is that really hot at one time? Yeah, so basically the granite's intruded in it. So mm -hmm. this is another hard thing to think about. So if you think about the current level 
of the earth here in Woodbury, right? Back when these granites were intruded, we were many kilometers down in the earth. And so we removed all that, you know, since that time. So you're looking probably right now at something that was down, uh, you know, up to 12, 12 kilometers or 7.2 miles, you know, when you're, when it was first intruded into the earth. So if they weren't popping up onto the surface of the earth. We're just looking at the erosional remnants of these. So if you can imagine, they're, they're like lacoliths. So even though you look at them and they look circular or elliptical on the earth's surface, they actually are like um, an upside down saucer, like this. And so they're a, a flattish bottom and then a domo or, or a, a, a snow saucer. And then with, with pipes coming from deeper, that are basically uh, forming that. And then well, when you rode down on them, you end up with these, <clears throat> the way they look like uh, upside down light, I mean, the tops of light bulbs in various areas. Is that what a batholith is? Well, a batholith is Jack, actually basically an uh, amalgamation of granite plutons. So, for example, they call, not here, but as you get up towards like Lake Willoughby, that at there's the Echo Lake granite, the Willoughby granite, Crystal Lake, um, and all those. They think that all those ones that you see as kind of bulb shape on the surface, as if you were to remove all the surrounding um, rocks, that they'd all be connected at depth, and that would be a batholith. Batholith is connected plutons. Yeah, yeah, pretty big. But then, then think about going out to the Sierras. And think about that. That's all a batholith too. Is it Mount Desert Island kind of? Similar? Yeah, yeah. That's the, the the well, the Cadillac granite. I guess that's all called that. But it's yeah. That's all evidently connected underneath, and it and it and it intrudes when you first <clears throat> go through Ellsworth. You know, on your way down there, the Ellsworth schist is this. Um, or division schist that that granite cuts into. And you see it in various places on the island when you're uh, having a beer. And, and, and you can look at places, <laughs> certain parts of the island where you actually have either big pieces out with elsewhere schist in the granite or um, the margins of the, the pluton where you can see the elsewhere schist. Something else I have on my land is these kind of rounded hills that are maybe 50 feet high, on a whole bunch of them. And I was told they're called canes uh, from when the glacier was eroding and there's a hole in the glacier and of course everything just came <coughs> right down the hole and formed those hills. Yeah, so I, I don't know if George had... Where is your, is your house on this map? No, no, it's a, it's almost in, in Hardwick. Oh, okay. Hardwick, bottom of Woodbury Gulf. Well, should, we, we actually have George and his colleagues have done other maps going up to Cabot and towards Hardwick and all that. You should look. But yeah, a, uh, a came is a reason why. It's a hole in the ice filled in with mm -hmm. uh, as the, the particles felt, melted out of the ice. Filled in the hole, then the ice melts away, and you're left with the cam. Yeah, yeah. Lousy soil. Cam hills. In between it is really yeah, because they're, 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 all, they're all till, yeah. Yeah, but they're sorted, right? Are they more? Um, well, cams tend not to be that sorted. I mean, there's some sorting because, you know, you actually had a hole in the ice, and then the ice was melting and stuff. But it's not that much sorting, like, compared to the, the deltas and the ice contact deposits I was showing. No, where you actually really have you there. actually have flowing mm -hmm. meltwater streams. Yeah, in Hardwick, just I mean you go Route 14, just south end of Hardwick, that huge sand deposits, perfectly sorted, fine grain sand. Is that a? That should, I, my bet is that that's one of those ice contact deposits. So you think about if if you're seeing the the uh, sand and gravel deposits right on the side of the valley, yep. that was when the ice was still in the middle of the valley. Yep. It was melting. And then you had, you know, pr prolific meltwater streams carrying the sands and gravels around, rounding it and sorting it. Is that a cane terrace? Is that? What that is? Yeah, you got cane terraces. The, the the stuff on the on the on the uh, valley walls. The sorted stuff where most of the gravel. And then if you were to go out, 
Route 15 towards 16, where you're going towards um, Green well, towards Barton, I guess. But but uh, yeah, there's you can see on the side of that valley, big sand and gravel deposits, which I assume are the same type of thing. Besides uh, drilling for water now, I guess I think Minash just got a rig that'll put a punch an 18-inch hole. And I think what they're doing is it's for uh, water source heat pumps. Yeah, so I, um, we were inv involved with one well in Williston that was 1,300 feet deep. So if you thought about the cost, that's the cost of a Mercedes Whoa. to drill. But it, what it was for was they were actually drilling that to do the open hole, open system heat pump, uh -huh. where essentially you're pulling water out put it back in and then water. putting back in the same hole. I don't know if they, they've changed that, because right now they actually have, I mean, a lot of people are putting the ones in their lawns where you have the coils yeah. and all that and going through a heat exchanger. I don't, I don't know whether they ever regulated the open yeah. hole. They were talking about it, but I don't. There seems to be some of the more, the new, really efficient places, they'll put in 25 more holes around mm -hmm. and then use those for their. Well, Champlain College has put in a whole bunch of geothermal wells. Um, I was out there for one of those. I mean, they hit uh, 450 gallons per minute at about uh, 500 feet, and it, it, and it was just gushing out the hole. I mean, mm -hmm. and it's a water for dormitory. All those showers. Well, it was actually it's actually for heating for them, oh. heating and cooling. Mm. Anybody else? Where's the best place to take your water to be tested? Uh, your, water, your well water. Okay, it's so one of the, well, the one of the best places to. First of all, if you go to the Vermont Department of Health website, water testing, they have different kits, right? That do sample for different and analyze for different things. And so, if you buy, I guess the thing that I would recommend that does the most common contaminants is called Kit C. And it's like a, it's a little it's over a little over a hundred bucks, but you you'll get about uh, a dozen different things that will include nitrate, arsenic, uranium, and all that stuff, <clears throat> and you'll get the results you know probably within a month. We have some flyers on that at the town office. Have you used any of the online ones that build? You can do four hundred tests for about I don't know five six hundred bucks. Stuff. No, I mean the only ones I I mean so the. Uh, Department of Health lab in Colchester, they have a brand new lab, and they, they do them, and that's, at, I know 120 bucks sounds expensive, but it's actually not that bad. You have to take the sample to the post office pretty quickly, and usually if you tell the post office what it is, they'll send it out, like, next day mail. So. Yeah. So the, the, there are other labs you can do. There's, there's, there's labs in Connecticut and Florida and various other ones, but the Department of Health lab is right here. So if you check that out, check out their website. And if you're thinking about particular contaminants, they have fact sheets on almost on all of them. And that's uh. Yeah, I just want to know what I'm drinking. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to know. <laughs> <laughs> it tastes awful good. It tastes great. <laughs> <laughs> they should find out. It shouldn't be. Put it through the coffee machine if it's all. Thank you for coming. Yeah, thank you so much.